like the, the amount of babysitting you have to do at, <laughs> at, on a Facebook group. I mean, God, I just, I'd rather just be your friend and give you whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> This is episode 197 of Bourbon Pursuit. I'm one of your hosts, Kenny Coleman, and let's run through a little bit of the news. It is with a heavy heart that we announce the loss of a bourbon legend, James Buddy Thompson. He was the former chairman of Glenmore Distilleries and was a previous guest back on episode 171. He passed away on April 5th. For those that don't remember, Buddy shared an incredible passion for bourbon, as well as a great connection to the military. He combined both of those to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars to veteran charities through his final reserve bottles. And those were all ranged, as you'd probably recall, that was the oldest bourbon to ever been bottled at around 40 to 45 years old with those two bottlings. I remember my first interaction with Buddy as we were discussing his 45 year old bourbon. I had to put my foot in my mouth because I got invited over there after saying some things on a round table recording. But we met in his office where he gave us the chance to record his story and it was shared on this podcast. He gave Ryan and I another glimpse and the rare opportunity to actually try this whiskey as well. He then, even after all that, he still invited me to a small gathering with about six other people to decide what to do with his final barrels because I remember him saying, this is it. This is the rest of them. And they were around 43 years old at the time. I remember being there and loving every second because we talked about finishing it with sherry or port or honey to overcome some of those tannins. But at the end of the day, it was decided to just leave it as is. And at this, as far as I know, those bottles still have yet to be released. So who knows what that's going to entail for the future. Buddy was as genuine as they come and he truly enjoyed what he was doing. I'm happy I got a chance to meet him and share that drink in his office. Cheers, buddy, and may you rest in peace. You can read more about his obituary and buddy himself on our show notes. Now, you may remember some podcasts ago, we announced that you should go out and needed to vote for the Eagle Rare Life Award. Eagle Rare has announced their 2019 Life Award recipient who is going to be giving $50,000 to the charity of his or her choice, and it is going to Army veteran Brian Anderson. And he's pushing this towards USA Cares a national nonprofit that is focused on assisting 9-11 veterans in their time of need. Anderson is a triple amputee, having lost both his legs and his left hand from an IED attack during a second tour of duty in Iraq. We're happy to have been a part of this rare life award process, and thank you to all those that took the time to go and vote. There's a good YouTube video, and you can find that as well in our show notes. We also purchased some new equipment this week, and that means we're brewing up a small project here with inside of Bourbon Pursuit headquarters. Thank you, as always, to our Patreon community who makes this possible. When you invest in us, we're able to invest in new equipment and bring even more bourbon content to you. So stay tuned to find out more. Today's show is going to be a fun one. No matter where you live across the globe, there's probably a bourbon society or a bourbon club you can join. And Really, we're going to look at today of what are the pros and cons of doing things, uh, say, a traditional way using dues and memberships versus something that's non-traditional, looking at online forums. So hopefully you can figure out how you align. And, you know, if you want to learn more, you should probably go out and find some people and really form one of these societies or join one or see what's inside of your area. Now, let's check out what Joe over at Barrel Bourbon has to say. And then we've got Fred Minnick with Above the Char. Hi, this is Joe from Barrel Bourbon. Every batch we produce has a distinct flavor profile. We take pride in blending and preserving spirits for the people who enjoy them the most. You. Find out more at BarrelBourbon.com. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Charm. Every shirt, jacket, pocket, and purse should have the right one for special events. And every one should be filled with the proper amount of whiskey for the right moment. I'm talking about flasks. And I'm here to tell you that not all flasks are created equal. I realized this about three months ago when I poured a draw out of a Blade and Bow press flask. The contents were green. No doubt this was an inferior metal leaching into the whiskey. 
Needless to say, I didn't drink the stuff. Not long after, I had another bad flask moment. I had this old tin flask sitting in the trunk of my car for most of the winter. I had forgotten about it and it just hung around with books, t-shirts, glassware, a random bottle of bourbon, and a spare tire. Well, I opened it just before fixing a lure, and it tasted like an aluminum can. After that moment, I went through my flask collection and got rid of all my similar flasks, only keeping the sterling silver ones, of which I had many. I've since had a much better experience with my flask whiskey. But I've noticed one other thing of late. I don't like higher proof ones from the flask. Reason being, if you're drinking straight from the flask, the whiskey shoots like a dart onto one spot of your tongue and burns the shit out of that particular circumference. So, from now on, I just pour the higher proof flask whiskey into my red Solo cup for a proper flask sip while I'm out fishing. And that's this week's Above the Char. Hey, check out my new magazine, Bourbon Plus. It's on newsstands. It has everybody's favorite tour guide on the cover, Freddie Johnson. You can find it at Whole Foods, Kroger, Liquor Barn, and wherever books are sold. Hit me up on Instagram or Twitter, at Fred Minnick. That's at Fred Minnick. Until next week, cheers! Welcome back to another episode of Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon. Tonight, Ryan and I are talking about a pretty cool subject because this is something that everybody is familiar with that doesn't matter where you live inside of the United States or actually around the world because we've had the British Bourbon Society on here at one point in a past podcast. So there are there are bourbon societies no matter kind of where you where you go. They're, they're everywhere. They're in every city and every state. And tonight we're going to be looking at a little bit of a, well, actually it's going to be a Kentucky versus Texas showdown. So it's going to be really kind of yeah. cool to, to see this. <laughs> so anyway, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to talk about uh, for Kentucky versus Texas, but also looking of what it looks like versus a, a, a traditional sort of society versus something that's maybe non-traditional, something that's more event focused rather than having all the Kentucky distillers in your backyard. So we're going to kind of look at what it takes to really make something truly successful uh, within this. So uh, Ryan, have you ever been to uh, any of the bourbon society meetings around here in Louisville? No, I'm not invited, I guess. Uh, <laughs> You're invited now. Everybody's invited. Everybody's, uh, if I'm not understanding, you always get one meeting free. You always get your, your first okay, taste. The first, your, first one's free. Yeah, like your first taste of crack. That's how it always goes. I got you. No, I'm, I, I, this is all new to me. You know, uh, we, We've been in some bourbon groups, but not a society. So uh, I'm interested to see what the difference is you know, between the two and kind of see what these guys do and offer. So I'm pretty excited to talk about this. Awesome. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce everybody just real quick, and then I'm going to let everybody kind of get a little bit more embellished. Uh, we're going to start with our, our guest from Texas, who, if we were recording in person, we would give him the, the, the furthest distance traveled award. But since we're doing this over Hangouts, it's everybody's fair on this one. So first, uh, we've got Pete Schmidt. Pete is part of the Dallas Bourbon Club, and we also have Christopher Hart, who is part of the Houston Bourbon Society. So fellas, welcome. Thanks, Thanks for, for having, having us. So, Pete, I'll let you go first. Just tell a little bit about Dallas Bourbon Club. Uh, I mean, it's in Dallas. It's in DFW. It's a huge footprint. But kind of give a little bit more information about the club in itself. Yeah, so we are an organization that's got three main focuses, bourbon and whiskey, networking, and local causes. So we try to generate money for charities around town as best we can. We try to put people in touch with each other based on their backgrounds and what, what they do. And uh, we like to get together for, for bourbon and whiskey at cool events. Sounds good. Chris, what about you? Or Christopher? Sorry. We'll go Chris. No, Chris is He's my society member. So, <laughs> so uh, my name is Christopher Hart. I help co admin the Houston Bourbon Society. We are a group of just under 4,200 members. Um, we were, we're mostly Houston, but we've got some other, we kind of basically, as long as you're Houston adjacent, we're okay with you being a part of the group. There's a lot of some South Dallas members, some Austin members. And of course we have a, your very own Kenny Coleman in, in the group as well, just, just to, to interact with those and other societies and kind of share the love. We've got a, a group out of Tampa that will, a few of these groups will kind of send some of their picks 
we, we do a lot of sharing. So the group, although it's pretty large, it's, it's, it's mostly Houston focused. Yeah. I, I'm more of a lurker in there and I always like to see you and Wade kind of go back and forth and then I'll be like, he's a troll. Bull. I'll be like, that's bullshit guys. Well, it's a bit of a madhouse at times as you, as you guys, and I know this episode will not air for a few months, but as you guys can see uh, from the bourbon exchange that the, the bourbon info exchange that the, when you get to a certain size, it, it definitely has its, uh, its madhouse moments. Absolutely. All right. So let's switch it back to home turf over here. So David, I'm going to let you go first from the Louisville Bourbon Society. And then we also have Matt Preston from the Lexington Bourbon Society. So David, I'll let you go first. All right, thank you for having me. So the Louisville, the Bourbon Society in Louisville is the original. It's one of the, one of the very first chartered in 2006. So we're a very traditional primary focused group. We have several hundred members with our three tiers being uh, bourbon, number one, bourbon education, two, and philanthropy, three. So ultimately, we're all here for the same reason. We have a love of bourbon. So as we continue to grow, we grow by having events, localized events, where we teach members about bourbon, get them acclimated to bourbon, introduce to distillers, really what you would think of as a traditional bourbon society. Uh, we are about to launch our bourbon university, which will start us down a course where we can start training folks within our group and outside our group on how to better understand flavor profiles, um, how to understand, uh, you know, things like nosing and things, all these various ingredients to help, to help enrich those that love bourbon, um, you know, in a, in a meaningful way. And David's also the president of the Bourbon Society here in Louisville as well. So make sure we, we get the, everybody's titles right. <laughs> it's very important in the society. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's these, I mean, everybody always like, you know, we all hate Ohio state at some point. So everybody's like the Ohio state, right. But that's the bourbon society. Right. That's so right. you gotta, you gotta give them their, their credit where credit's due. All right. So Matt, I'm going to let you go ahead and wrap us up here. Absolutely. Uh, let me lead off by saying we are not the Lexington bourbon society. <laughs> 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 just jokes, but we're really not. So, so when we incorporated, we're a 501 C, we're a 501 C seven, which is a social club. And we do just that. We use whiskey, bourbon, uh, the like to get together and raise money for local charities, uh, regional charities and swap bottles, uh, Chrome bottles, do a wide variety of things. And, uh, you know, we're, we're a social group. We, our board is very much focused on keep it social. We, we've got, we don't even have 200 members and, and, and that's fine. You know, when, when we have our board meetings and we say, okay, we're almost to 200, let's talk about it then. If we get to 300, then we talk about it then. My wife and I started this and, and we didn't know what it would become. Uh, she and I did a blind tasting for each other in 2007, uh, poured about five or six airplane bottles and she took some notes and, and I took some notes and then it's kind of blossomed into this. So it's been a lot of fun to, to be able to, to, to bring folks together uh, with the native, uh, America's Native Spirit and, and raise money for charity. That's about half of what we do. The other half is swap bottles, public service, you know, on our, on, on our closed Facebook page or whatever. Hey, today there's this on the shelf at here and people go get it. And then we swap and trade. We've got a, an advent calendar coming out uh, in December. It's been a lot of fun. We've done it a few years. Uh, you take a bottle, 24 one ounce samples. Everybody has a different bottle. You, you just donate it, and then you've got a, a calendar for the month of December to sip on something that you wouldn't necessarily have. So that's a lot of fun. Absolutely. The chocolate cool. pieces, you know, that I get that, that aren't very good. Or if you have the bad Santa one, it's an aspirin. <laughs> 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 no, we've got pretty good. We've got pretty good calendars. I, I print out, I take the label and I put it on the date in October and we all meet together and, and trade out our one ounce sample bottles and then, and then share some fun stuff. And, uh, I love that. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. We you have the Christmas tree with fun little doors. The, no, we don't. We have not. We've had people, we've got members in Brisbane, Australia, several in Florida, Maryland, Virginia. So, you know, we're, if you want to be a member because you want to have first dibs on our bill picks, then that's great. 
you know, we've got a couple different levels of, of membership. Some are uh, simply that where, you know, you don't get a T-shirt, you don't get a Glen Karen, you don't get all that stuff. But you stay a member because you want to you want first dibs on a Russell's pick. That's that's a really good pick or whatever. But we've had people email us and say, how can I buy this advent calendar? And we're like, well, you really can't because, you know, the logistics are a little bit tough. You know, go ahead and start your own whiskey society or bourbon society, and then you're good to go. <laughs> or you just figure out a way to just sell them on Amazon and you make a few extra bucks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly right. But but we're a nonprofit, and and uh, and, and we're going to keep it that way, I guess. <laughs> so it sounds like so it's for, it's a pretty. It seems like there's there's three commonalities that that come through here, at least to be successful, right? So there's there's the love of bourbon, right? There's just bourbon in general. There's charity, but there's also events and events. I kind of want to hit on next because the way that you host or you do events has got to be different based on these parts of the regions uh, of the country. And so I'm going to let the guys from Kentucky go first. So David, I just want you to kind of talk about what the events look like, who you're inviting. uh, It's sort of what's the talk track. Is it, you know, what's it look like? All right. So generally when we, any sort of events we do at our meetings, uh, we try to bring somebody in naturally distillers, uh, master distillers typically, uh, although we can have really anybody from from the industry be involved. Uh, generally, for the first 11 months, we've got master distillers come in. We'll do tastings along with all the bottles that our members bring. Generally, there's about 50 to 75 open bottles at our at our events. Uh, and, and really, the point is is to get get our members and our guests acclimated to something new. Uh, we've got Hartfeld and Company, and again, I know this is is sort of a timing thing, but um, you know, we bring in we bring in some of the smaller distillers to give people a chance to try something different. Um, and in addition to that, uh, of course, we sample some of our own barrel picks. Uh, you know, many of our members bring some some pretty eccentric bottles. So uh, typically. Uh, you know, our, our events look exactly like, hey, we, we have a, a social hour. Uh, we've got time to share. We incorporate this, uh, the, this, this component of, of teaching about a distiller, let a master distiller talk about their product, what makes them different. And then we sort of finish off with some, some additional social time. So uh, everything always includes some sort of education piece. Um, you know, an obscure bottle, a uh, new product line, a new distillery, um, you know, a chance to really bring some folks, uh, sort of uh, bring them front and center. Uh, a lot of these smaller distillers just haven't had a chance to be seen or tasted in many cases. David, uh, I guess another quick question for you is what's the when you have when you have something that's like, a, say, Brent from Four Roses or you've got um, David from, or, uh, from MB Roland, whoever it is. Right. Let's. What's what's is there a is there a difference in the turnout or is it usually pretty pretty much the same uh, of of the attendance that's that's being driven? You, you know, I can say that that by and large we have we have a, a fairly strong core that is really uh, you know is really in attendance just about every meeting. Um, you will see um, you know if we've got let's say uh, Marianne Barnes from Castle and Key or somebody that uh, you know a Jim Rutledge who's who's working on his new distillery if we've got any of those sort of guests they have a tendency to spike uh, you know guest attendance uh, see some faces we don't see but we generally have a, a strong core that attends every meeting. Are you like we haven't seen you in five events, but now you come out? You know, <laughs> we, 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 that yes, that does happen. <laughs> you got to get on them every once in a while. All right, so I'm going to flip it over to the guys from Texas and Pete. I kind of want you to kind of talk about your all's events first. Is yeah, I'm kind sure of, they're different than the ones in Kentucky. It's hard absolutely. to get. <laughs> well, there's a couple of things going on in Texas. One is there's a lot of small guys out there in Dallas, especially and. We've got a lot of people that just love trying something new, the education part, and then to meet the guy, shake his hand, and hear that brand story while you're tasting it with them is pretty cool. So we've got some local guys we've been able to meet with and, and have some good events with. The other part that we have is Texas is pretty hot. I don't know if you guys know this, but it's the weather <laughs> capital of the world. Mm-hmm. And um, so – Bourbon companies realize it's a it's a big market and Dallas is is a big place to be. So 
there's a lot of road shows those guys go on. They come out to Dallas, they find us or we find them and, and we get them out for drinks at a bar, drinks at someone's house. And um, we've been able to do that as well, whether that's through networking through local liquor reps or good old fashioned LinkedIn cold calls. We've been able to connect with some some people and they want to come to Texas. I mean, do you think that's a pretty good strategy to and, and are, are you trying to find people that are like in the Kentucky area to kind of come out and do this? Are they actually distillers? Are they brand representatives that are in the area? Like who's the who's the the person that you're really targeting here? So we've we've had some success with some local managers of uh, distil- distilleries and big dis- distribution companies here in Dallas, and they've been able to work up the chain. And Dallas is hot enough to get get the Harlan Wheatleys of the world to come to us. Oh, that's good. Yeah, Makes, very cool. Yeah, a lot less travel expenses to get the private jet out there from the Cowboys or something and <laughs> fly everybody to. Kenny and I will gladly do your next event. You, know, yeah. good <laughs> you hear, uh, you hear, talk about spiking events. I mean, it's like local guy, pretty good. Harlan Wheatley, <laughs> we're mm-hmm. packing a house. So, uh, you know, we we uh, we try to go after the names, you know, but there's plenty of local guys here in Dallas as well. Cool. So, Chris, I want to kind of turn it over to you too. Uh, and before we start talking about traditional versus non-traditional, because I know that yours is a very non-traditional kind of group, but kind of talk about the events that you all host first. Yeah. So, uh, similar to Peter's situation, what we do is we host events uh, throughout the year. It, it's kind of a, a. It all started in kind of a weird place. I started a whiskey festival here in Houston just before the Houston Bourbon Society became a group. And we ended up merging together and I would promote the club at my events that, that are held around town and the group grew from that. And then all of a sudden I started adding all my uh, distributor contacts, all of my, uh, the brand reps that I work with for the event to the group. And then it just became this massive entity. I mean, it's grown organically, but it's grown explosively and our events are, are not, I mean, I know there's some difference between what Peter was saying and, and the Louisville events, but it, it's essentially the same idea. You get together in a social aspect, sub, sit down with the brand reps. Uh, you know, we've got something going on now. Fred knows here in Houston tonight doing a uh, makers event, and I was supposed to go and cover that, but I'd rather be here with you guys. Oh, so, thank you. Uh, so, uh, well, I, you know, it's, it's a, I've sat down with Fred before. I mean, it's definitely an honor, and I'll see him tomorrow, but uh, it's, it's an, it really... I know we're here tonight to talk about the differences between traditional and the, the new wave of Facebook, which is, let's be honest, Facebook has changed what it means uh, marketing-wise for bourbon uh, nationally, globally. And uh, there are a lot more similar- similarities than I think there are differences. Uh, I think uh, what everyone's doing, I'm hearing a lot of the same thing. There's a charity aspect. We do everything with uh, the Warriors for Freedom, which is a veterans charity. Uh, it, everything's, I think there are more similarities and there are differences. I, I have a lot of respect for the, uh, the history and something like Louisville, you know, obviously bourbon has been around a long time. Houston was not seen as a viable market. Texas was not seen as an overall viable market for real craft spirits up until the last four or five years. Uh, and now it just seems to have changed completely between the Houston bourbon society. There are five or six Houston groups. There's five or six Dallas groups. There are a few in Austin and now San Antonio and even one in Beaumont that's just exploded. And everyone's doing barrel picks. Everyone's doing events. Um, it, it, it's, it's such a fun time to be involved in any of this. And, and like I said, to beat it to death, I think there are more similarities and there are differences between any of us. So are all these events all bourbon focused or is there any like cross interest, say like cigars or barbecue, food, music or something else that, you know, could attract, you know, uh, somebody outside of bourbon? Well, that's a great question because actually the problem, festivals have not thrived here. There have been plenty that have come and gone, but a lot of the brands hate live music at these events, which is different because you guys just did bourbon and beyond, which is a full blown thing. But every in my opinion, every city is at different stages. And at the stage that Texas is, which is a, a stage that I think deserves recognition, it's at, at this stage, the brands hate live music at these events because they want to be able to 
to talk about their brands to mm -hmm. guests and customers. And when there's music going on, you, you have to scream, your voice is hoarse. And if you're pouring for, you know, all day, it's not, it's not a viable thing. So we don't do music at our events. Now at my event specifically, uh, we do mix it up. I, I know that I know you guys are bourbon pursuit, but uh, the Houston Bourbon Society really could be called the Houston Spirit Society because as Kenny and I recently had a little bit of a Facebook debate on, uh, I think that bourbon, as monumental as it is, uh, is become such a expensive hobby for, for special releases that a lot of people are branching out. So you see a lot of Armagnac being posted in the group. You see a lot of Scotch being posted in the group. I think people are uh, – it's not always bourbon. The, the last event we did at Poison Girl was an event for the American Heart Association, and that was obviously bourbon focused. But uh, you see a lot of a lot of whiskey. Period. So the other question that I kind of want to ask, and, and Pete, I'll kind of move it over to you too, because I'm sure that these Kentucky boys aren't going to mess with anything <laughs> except bourbon at their events. Do you know? Do you guys look at this as like half whiskey, half bourbon societies? Like, what what do you all really bring into the table? Or are you trying to promote bourbon as much as you can with inside your clubs and societies? <laughs> We're bourbon, bourbon, bourbon. You know, there's there's guys out there like uh, Christopher was saying. Maybe maybe bourbon's getting a little too expensive. You're tired of paying two hundred, three hundred dollars for something you really want, so you try something else. But at our events, it is bourbon, bourbon, bourbon. When people bring something, and uh, it's BYOB. And Chris, you know, kind of just tail onto that because I know you said you had done your whiskey social. I mean, what's is there a good breakdown of whiskey versus bourbon in that you, sort of category? Well, you know what's fascinating when it comes to throwing these these big events. So the the whiskey social is now uh, is currently, which could change at any moment, uh, is currently the largest festival at uh, in Texas. Uh, bourbon brands at this point, especially brands like Sazerac, the brands that people go crazy for they have such a small marketing budget for doing these events because they don't need to. Old Weller Antique's going to sell. Eagle Rare is going to sell. So getting them to come to these events, it, it's not a common occurrence because typically these events cost to be there. So um, as a breakdown, traditionally speaking, at any major festival anywhere other than Louisville, uh, I would say, or anywhere outside of Kentucky, I would say it's usually a – heavy lean on overall whiskey category with maybe a 30% uh, bourbon category. But we really do have a massive bourbon following here in Houston. Our event, I would say, probably was about half and half bourbon and then rye whiskey and scotch and the other, the other categories. Cool. So the next thing I kind of want to hit on was what Chris had already kind of alluded to was we're going to kind of go and talk about a, a traditional approach, which is probably going to be uh, both – Louisville, Lexington, and probably Dallas as well. When you have this sort of, you know, you have you pay for membership, you get access, you you get this and this and this uh, versus Chris's, which is this basically just massive online community forum where people can just come to get together. So, uh, Matt, I'll kind of lean it on here uh, on you real quick. So, when you're when you're paying and you're accessing to be a part of a club, what are all the benefits that you're necessarily getting out of it? When when we started up, our, our model was a little bit different. Uh, we looked to, to Louisville Bourbon Society and, and, and their sister club up in Cincinnati and kind of were like, how are they doing it? They're meeting once a month. They do a lot of barrel picks. And, and we decided what's going to be the best way for us to make somebody feel like if they pay us dues of $100 a year, what, what, what are they going to get? And what are they going to feel like? that they're going to want to renew again for uh, the following year. So we do a lot of things. We started getting barrel picks going. Uh, but again, we're not massive. You know, we're 200 people. Uh, and, and we let our members suggest events. And and we have big events, small events, master distillers, chroming bottles, all this kind of stuff. So we, 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 we felt like the best thing we could do was uh, three or four things a month. Small things, big things. If you miss this one, then you get to maybe make that one because your schedule allows it. So we 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 send out uh, Survey Monkey and that kind of thing each year and say, "What do you like? What do you don't like? What would you like to see? 
obviously we don't say, what would you like to go pick a barrel up? Because that's not reality. But, <laughs> but, 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 you know, the, the glass that I'm drinking out of is, is, uh, is, uh, again, I'm, you think I was plugging, uh, uh, flame run glass studio, but we go a couple times a year in Louisville and, and on, on, on West uh, market street. And, uh, we set up a little, little room upstairs. We've got whiskey, we've got food. You pick a couple colors, you pick your design of your glass and you get to make your own whiskey glass, which is really a lot of fun. So we try to do things that, that, that branch out and are not always just in a room with a guest speaker and it's a little bit more interactive and it can be 10 people or it can be 40 or 50 people. So yeah. I, I cool. so David, I'm going to lean on you a little bit here. So do you, do you look at this as, as having sort of a, a club that you not necessarily initiate into, right. But you, you apply to you, you're a part of, do you, do you see it being a little bit more intimate than saying a, uh, a, a large Facebook group that you can just add yourself to? Well, I, I do want to say first to to Christopher because I would agree with what we're here for for one reason. We have a love of bourbon, and whether it's traditional or whether it's it's online, I can't think of a better way to enjoy our spirit in both places. Um, when it comes to you know sort of our meetings, you know one could say I, I don't I don't know if I would call them intimate. But what I would say is, is that we have a lot of, of people that get together that like to, to share ideas and, and to enjoy, um, you know, to enjoy bourbon together. And, um, you know, although our, our, our meetings tend to be a little bit larger, um, we still have plenty of time to, to, to sort of get together and, and, um, and, and really get with the people that, that, you know, we love and, and share a spirit or something that we brought that was special. Um, you know, but I can't say it enough, whether we're a membership based or we're, a, we're a Facebook group, really we're about enjoying something that's incredible. Uh, and, 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 and like you've, you know, we've all talked about, this is an American spirit and, and to enjoy it in all these different ways. Uh, I love it. I love it. And I encourage it. And, and we, we want to be a part of all of it. So, David, can you walk me through like one of your meetings? Is there like rituals like we do this, this and this or that way? Or like <laughs> Bourbon Pursuit wouldn't be possible without the support of our Patreon community and with help of our following partners. Stepping through those gates of whiskey prison, it's like taking a step back in time. Southern Grace Distilleries at Mount Pleasant Prison hasn't made any updates to the structure of the prison since it moved in in 2016. The flickering lights in the background the faint sound of water dripping in the distance, a gush of steam, and the clanging of a wrought iron door. That's what the guys at Rackhouse Whiskey Club experienced when they visited to see what's being distilled inside. Beyond the impressive story, they found some really good whiskey. The next Rackhouse Whiskey Club box ships in April, so choosing what to feature was a difficult decision. But they're excited to be featuring the double gold medal award-winning Conviction Small Batch Bourbon. It's the first bourbon ever to legally be aged behind bars. And they also get a bottle of their Sun Dog Pink Lemonade, which was named the 2017 USA Spirited Lemonade of the Year. Rackhouse Whiskey Club is a Whiskey of the Month club, and they're on a mission to uncover the best flavors and stories that craft distilleries across the U.S. have to offer. Rackhouse's box ships out every two months to 40 states, and along with bottles, includes some cool merchandise. Go to RackhouseWhiskeyClub.com to check it out and taste the freedom of Whiskey Prison. Use code PURSUIT for $25 off your first box. Bourbon and Beyond. The world's biggest music and bourbon festival is even bigger. September 20th, 21st, and 22nd at Highland Festival Grounds of the Kentucky Expo in Louisville with Foo Fighters. Zach Brown Band. Robert Plant and the Sensational Space Shifters. Daryl Hall and John Oates, John Fogarty, ZZ Top, Leon Bridges, and more. Complete lineup of musical artists and celebrity chefs at bourbonandbeyond.com. So, David, can you walk me through like one of your meetings? Is there like rituals? Like we do this, this, and this, or that way? Or like, <laughs> well, we well, all say it, this breed or. You know. yeah, yes, uh, uh, we bring out the goats. No. The, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, candles. it's funny. There's, there's candles, there's chanting. 
The um, it's like a fraternity <laughs> initiation. <laughs> As president, do you have a robe? <laughs> uh, I have I have requisition, but it's not arrived. But you know the. The, the funny thing is, you know, it started off that, you know, it's it's after work and uh, and it's, it's getting earlier and earlier. Um, you know, we have to get there hours earlier because people start arriving, bringing their bottles, getting their favorite spot. Um, so so traditionally, even though our meeting doesn't typically start till 630 uh, and really 630 is sort of the social hour. And we bring our, our, our speaker, our master distiller in at seven. Uh, I mean. Folks start getting there at 5.30, 5 o'clock, uh, so they can start talking about their newest picks. So generally the way it works is, uh, is, is folks will start getting there. They'll, they'll, they'll start sharing their bourbon, uh, sharing their stories, sharing their barrel picks, uh, and, and really work their way through until we get to uh, really our master distiller or, or whoever we've got as our speaker for the evening. Uh, in which, at that point, they're going to start distributing whatever their product or whatever it is that they uh, that they represent that evening, and so we sort of have a mix of uh, a time to 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 catch up with friends. Uh, we have a time to learn about new bourbons and 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 new things in the bourbon industry, uh, and then we sort of cap it off with um, you know some some more time to to sit and 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 discuss new things. Um, all the while in the background, of course, we, we, you know, there's food there. We've got all of our barrel picks there. And so uh, it's, it's a very loose, the, the only section of the meeting that's, that's really, that's really sort of strict is, is when we give our attention to the, to the speakers. It, so Pete, cool. there's one question I kind of want to ask you before we uh, turn it over a little bit. So what do, what do you see your dues going to? David had mentioned food at the meetings and stuff like that. What is, what are the dues when people are paying it on a yearly basis? What are they, what are they really re getting in return for some of these? Yeah. To, to echo what they said, you got to make it worth it. So we, we are always on the lookout for cool, new Glen Cairns, cool, new Sterling cut glass.com products. <laughs> good plug, good plug. We love the Kentucky double. Uh, <laughs> stickers, things like that, you know, shirts. We want to be able to provide our guys with gear that they can wear around town. They've already paid for stuff like that. So no need to double charge them. We want to, we want to make sure that they can show up an event and not have to worry about dinner. They can, you know, if they bring the wife to our Christmas party type of thing, we've got some white wine, <laughs> gin and tonic, whatever for them. So we want to make sure that we can take care of as much as possible when we host an event. Sometimes that's three hundred dollars, five hundred dollars toward a bar tab, things like that. Cool. So now let's kind of turn it over to, to Christopher a little bit here, because you know a lot of these these guys in these uh, formal kind of societies, they they all have dues. They pay them. It goes towards the functions. However. Chris is a little bit different because it's a it's a very large online community. However, you still hold events. You're still able to do this. Are you looking to charge on a per person per ticket basis? Kind of kind of how does that work in uh, on your end? So it's a bit. Uh, there's a lot of overlapping that happens. Uh, I have my whiskey festival, which is separate from the Houston Bourbon Society, but we do a lot of stuff for the events or, or for the group locally in terms of events. Uh, but it's usually, you know, it, it takes two hours to get to from one side of Houston to the other. So we've got a weekly get together at a cigar lounge, which doesn't cost anything. You just come, bring cigars, bring a bottle share, as we're all familiar with. Uh, that happens on the south side. We've got guys up on the north side to get together. So it's more of like a, I, I have a, like a, I said before, I have a tremendous amount of respect for these structured old school. Uh, or more traditional ways of having a society. I was about to say, there's there's this first throw, the first stone uh -oh. that was just thrown. No, 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 no. <laughs> like you guys are lame. Our our is <laughs> right. way better. It's it's, We're it's all just it's, messing. It's, it's the coffee talking. No, mm -hmm. I, I have a lot of respect for the traditional forms. Coffee, because, sure. Because, because <laughs> <laughs> this is a lot of work, even as a non-traditional uh, side of this thing. Uh, you know, I have a full-time job in aviation. Uh, the, the, my own show that I do locally, the festival, and then this online group that requires a, a tremendous amount of maintenance. So I have a, a ton of respect for you guys that have this traditional format where you bring in dues and, and, and have to like generate 
uh, a return on their investment. It, it's a it, it's something that I I simply don't have time for, and there hasn't really been uh, a push for that locally. Now, as far as the events for the group go, what we do is we just simply ask that people prepay for events. So, for instance, if we do a dinner, we we got the as I mentioned before, we do we do uh, uh, special events with brands. And uh, last Christmas we did an event. We we got the the actual public launch for Glenfiddich's IPA cask single malt. And so we just I coordinate. We we do a lot with bars and restaurants locally, all the the big bourbon and whiskey bars in Houston. And I coordinate with my contacts there, and we say, okay, we're going to do a dinner on this date. We we figure out a price that seems appropriate, and then all that money, when people RSVP, they pay, and then it gets passed directly to. The restaurant, no one makes any money on it. I don't make any money on it. The group doesn't have a treasury. It, it's a straight pass through. So we, we get to invite new people. We get to have that camaraderie. We get to have those meetings. Uh, and it and it doesn't, it's not necessarily a fees driven. There's a level of accountability too when you guys have that traditional structure that uh, it just, it's so much more work than than I think a lot of people don't realize for, for people like you. Uh, I, I, it feels like I'm insulting you. I'm really, you're, not, I'm you're, really not. You're, not, you're not insulting me. I, I, I've almost gotten divorced over the fact that I. I <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mentioned I mentioned before. I've got a wife and four kids. <laughs> yeah. And we had we had the last two back to back, and we used a midwife, so I I delivered them, and uh, trying to like justify. Hey, honey, can I play on my Facebook group for a little bit while? It, it's a it's a difficult, these are my internet friends yeah it's a it's a difficult <laughs> task to, to, to maintain and if you've got an actual club with dues uh and and a, and a prerogative to generate uh, a return it's you guys deserve a, a pat on the back more than than i think many people don't realize do you find it difficult to have a consistency in like people showing up to these events because like i feel like with the the traditional society you'd be like all right, we have the same people coming. We get familiar with them versus yours. It's kind of, all right, this event seems appealing to me, so maybe I'll go to it. And then there's kind of new faces all the time, and you never really get that, like, consistent, I guess, feel of a group. So that's a that's a phenomenal question. And this will be something that I'm going to go ahead and just say is different from the traditional format to, to now. One of the consistent feedback, uh, one of the, the more consistent feedback items that we receive from brands is that, they don't want to just be doing events with the same faces. They want to grow the brand. That's the whole purpose in participating in these events. And sometimes that's the whole purpose in them paying for these events. Even if they don't pay me, they've got to coordinate with a restaurant and bring the product in in a certain way. And I hope no one in, in the federal government's listening but everyone here is nah, somewhere, you just oh, one or two. Yeah. But TABC they, is watching. But yeah. they're to the Dallas I, Bourbon Clubs. Are you but guys they're, they're fans? With, they're fans, so it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Are you familiar with credit card swipes? <laughs> like, uh, like credit card what? <laughs> yeah, so like, what? what? What are you talking what? about? So it's yeah, yeah, yeah. So essentially, in order to to approach a restaurant and say, "Hey, we want to host an event with fifty people." Uh, and I, I tell them, hey, listen, we're just going to generate a menu and everything will go straight to you. The brand still has to bring in the product, the proper legal channels. And the brand doesn't want to pay for their own product at a at a retail and then at a bar markup. So they normally work something out behind closed doors that's completely legal. But uh, it, it's in order to go through that hassle, they'd like to see some new faces. So our events, I think that is the one thing that differentiates us from these these traditional styles is we have a, uh, there's always room for more. Like we're not trying to drive membership growth. It's a natural organic growth. But with 4,100, almost 4,200 members in a city of this size, you are going to see some traditional faces, people that you always see at a lot of these events. But you you're going to see a, a constant turnover of new regular members. So even in HBS, every couple of months, there's a new member that's that's dove head first and is commenting and posting and coming to every event. And so you will see some of the same faces, but there there is a growth there of, of, of new faces that you wouldn't normally see in a traditional setting. Well, I would say on the traditional side, you do see some organic growth. You see some people like, well, I just 
decided to bring my buddy and then there's a new face there and sure you know what it's a friend of a friend so he's cool with us stick around let's let's chat you up let's get to know you what do you like to drink well and and and, and our organic growth speaking you know when 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 the board got together and said do we want to start to advertise and spend money on on gaining membership and 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 all of us came together and said no let it grow organically but there is no big push for growth 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 more sure. more 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 and and you kind of know a new member when you meet them oh yes. sure sure Absolutely. i i think both of these are, are great arguments and, and christopher i i love yours of being able to say that uh, especially because as you had mentioned a brand does want to come in. They want to try to advertise the new faces all the time. They they've got to they've got to grow their brand, and that's essentially why they are are footing the bill. But I guess that's also the flip side of of the dues that are actually paying for the bill in some of these places, rather than the brand coming in and paying for it too. Am am I incorrect in saying that somebody can well, feel free to correct me? Well, so yeah, it depends on if so whether you're a structured uh, I'm a traditional way of having a, a bourbon club or you're the new Facebook way, if the event's being held at least in Texas in a, in a licensed location, that brand's still going to have to pay for it, even if your members are paying dues. So the, the brand is still going to pay essentially the same amount. It's not going to matter either way. So for instance, when we did the Glenfiddich IPA launch, we also, you don't want to just have people pay 45 bucks to come have dinner and try one whiskey. So we paired it with an IPA beer so they can try to find the similarities. We also brought in the Glenfiddich 26, the Glenfiddich 21 to kind of really make people feel. So going back to proving a return on people's investments, it is a lot more. Uh, I'm not going to say our, our job is more difficult, but I'm saying we we have to try to prove a, re, a, a value to members who pay on a event basis as opposed to annual membership. So when, when we do have a launch and I ask people to pay a certain amount, I've got to make sure that I really blow it out of the water for them. Otherwise, they don't come back to the next one. Uh, it's, it's essentially, that's what I meant earlier about similarities. It's the same problem, just slightly tweaked depending on if you're a traditional or non-traditional format. I think there's so much more similarities between us and there are differences. It's just a different way of going about the same goal. Well, and, that's and, true. And, and to go ahead, go ahead. Uh, yeah, well, I wanted to say something, uh, you know, Christopher, when we talk about sort of kind of how we mesh the two together, you, you know, I think it's important, uh, you know, one of the one of the things that really is, uh, is, it, as I think about the Facebook groups, as I think about the traditional groups, I, I think it's really important to point out that although we do have crossover, uh, you know, we, in some cases, we meet sort of different audiences. And, sure. and I think we, and I think that's where we shine together is that we have the ability to push a brand we love, a product we love, and we can push it through all sorts of different ways. And, and I, and I applaud the Facebook groups and, and I will tell you, I don't think it's any less work what you have to go through sure. than what we have to go through. It's just different work. I agreed. So. Agreed. Yeah. And, and I, and I, 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 you know, Kenny may have hoped for a more uh, I, I, I hope, okay. <laughs> Shaking his head. I was no. like, wait, I, I don't want punches to be like virtually thrown here. I don't want that. We're, we're all going to come away friends at the end of this. We're, we're a little bit of a like hybrid them. of the two. I mean, we're, we're, we, we are membership based, but we are also very much Facebook communication based. And we've got plenty of members that are on Facebook and they're like, well, make sure you email us. So, so that's been an added component for us is to, 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 to email everybody and Facebook at the same time and at the exact same moment. So that if I say that I've, I've found a bottle of, of, of this and it's a retail, you know, if, if whoever wants in and wants to buy it for this amount, we'll, we'll randomize your name and whoever's at the top gets to take it. So we're a little bit of a hybrid on it. And, and, sure. And, and when it when it comes to when it comes to big events and, and, and brand sponsorship, you know, we do something every right around July for or I'm sorry, uh, June 1st every year, which is when Kentucky's birthday is. And, and we've had it the past couple of years and we call it the Commonwealth Bash. And we get 
our, our, our distilleries to donate because it's going to go to the Lexington History Museum or whatever the charity is. So they, the, the caterer, or if we get the license, we'll buy the product. And it, it, on the back end, the distillery will pay for the wholesale portion of whatever was, was, was poured that night. And then that money goes to the charity. So, so it's, it's kind of a hybrid way to, to, to bring it all together with, yes, we're going to brand promote you. You're going to have this space. You're going to be able to put a table up. You can pour neat pours. You can have a cocktail, whatever you want to have. You're going to have your own booth space for a one night situation, but we're expecting you to be able to write the check back to the charity at the end of the event to reimburse for that. So that becomes part of the charitable portion. So that's, that's, that's been a fun way to be able to kind of work around. Uh, we're going to promote your brand, but we're not going to have to spend a bunch of money, but we still ask for $75 a member or, or anybody it's 70, it's 60 bucks a member or 75 bucks for non-members to come to this event. So members are still paying money, but it has to be worth it for them to pay that much money to come to an event like this, where they're going to have independent state company come in and do a barrel presentation. They're going to have uh, multiple things in one venue for one evening, but they know that those funds are going to go to the Lexington history museum or some other local charity. So, so they're okay with paying dues as well as also paying per event. Yeah, that, I mean, that sounds like an incredible uh, system that you have in place. You know, I, I I really would like to maybe we can chat off air, but I, Absolutely. I'm curious, I I know that you guys have some your, your laws there in in Kentucky are so much uh, I just I would say so much better than the laws here in Texas. Uh, being able to buy a bottle from a bar, or uh, you know, I mean, just any number of things. Being able to buy old bottles, it, it's so much more. We have to hell dance. buying a bottle of liquor on Sunday. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> big, big, we, we, we have to do so much more dancing around something as simple as hey, just. That's pouring. just recent here. <laughs> yeah, reason. I mean, we're still in in the early nineteen hundreds in Texas, so yeah. But you, still, got, still, you, 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 you get get you get on no the roller twelve, roll 12, so whatever. You guys have no idea. I mean. We can. <laughs> True. It is. It is liquor run, or state run liquor stores that close at nine o'clock. No big market chains. It it sucks. No Sunday. <laughs> Just you imagine can't... trying to bring stuff in. We've we've brought a few brands to, to and and gotten them state distribution, including MB Roland and Lynn Cantata, and just trying to jump through those hoops and trying to get brands to Texas so we can get more because we're, we're playing catch up. We're perpetually playing catch up to, yeah. to Kentucky and it's, it's a bit unfair. So there's automatically, uh, there's been many times I've wanted to unfriend some of you guys after watching some of these episodes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm jealous of you, man. It's, it's incredible. Louisville's got it going on. Connect us to some Kentucky lawyers or something. <laughs> yeah. Brian Hara. So let's go ahead because I, I want to start wrapping it up because we've, we've, we're probably over our, our 45 minutes creeping on the hour here. Uh, I think I think the best way that we can we can all come together is maybe we should do a, a big society barrel pick together because it seems like that's yeah, that absolutely. is also a corner. It is a cornerstone yes. of a society in general, right? <laughs> Finally, moving Russell's forward together. Yeah. I, 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 I suggest a Russell's Reserve. I've enjoyed a couple of those recently that have been incredible, just incredible. I think I think between as many people, I mean, I know you guys are basically speaking for the collective of the Dallas Bourbon Club, the Houston Bourbon Society, everything you guys are doing. Let's convince Eddie Russell to fill a hundred gallon barrel. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, the, the yield is going to be like one hundred and forty bottles. Like yeah. we're going to have to be able to make a. We need more bottles than just one barrel. Maybe big a small batch blend. Big, big port barrel or a big, big. Uh, uh, well, gentlemen, I guess we're going to have to pick two or three. Maybe an old. <laughs> sounds, sounds horrible. Maybe an old Baldy <laughs> pick or a Russell, a Russell small batch blend because I know OWA's done a couple of them. You know, Cork and Bottle did that uh, a couple months ago. Maybe we can convince Eddie Russell to three batch blend. Or we just keep all the bottles for us six and we call it a day. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly right. More cheers, to, cheers to that. 
<laughs> Smart yeah. guy. There you go. Well, you know, with these kind of numbers, we could probably do an Elmer T. Lee. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll ask Chris Comstock if he's ready to let us do that. <laughs> there you go. Love it. As long as somebody's got his direct line, we can make it happen. I got his direct line, I promise. He lives four blocks from it. <laughs> oh, even better. Just go knock on his door after this. I will. I will. I'm going <laughs> <laughs> all right. So uh, one last time, I, I want to say, uh, first off, thank you all for, for coming on. This has been a, f- a fun conversation, but I also want to give you uh, a last minute chance to sort of plug your society and club and where people can find you, how they can join, uh, so on and so forth. So Matt at Lexington, I'm going to start with you. Yeah, uh, I appreciate you all inviting me to be here for tonight. It's It's been a lot of fun. We're a small group. We're a social group. We love to get together, trade whiskey, sip whiskey, raise money for charity, LexingtonBourbonSociety.com. We're definitely on Facebook, occasionally on Twitter, even less occasionally on Instagram. But, <laughs> uh, you know, we're, we're, we very much love brown water and, and, and how it can and can raise money for local local and regional charities. So check us out. Well, see, the, the good thing you can do with the traditional is that you can hire a social media chair and then they, take, right. over, they take over Instagram. Well, I, 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 real I, good. I, 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 that's why I'm still married because I, I have persuaded some of my board members to actually step the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that technical term? That's not technical. <laughs> that's me getting in trouble. Drinking too much whiskey on a Wednesday. It's all good. <laughs> David, I'll let you go ahead and do next. All right. Well, thank you for having me. I really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, it's it, it's something I really, really enjoy. Um, love the company. Love love everyone that's involved. Uh, we can be found at www.thebourbonsociety.org. Um, I will say that that going forward, the face of, of our society is going to change in many, many ways. Uh, including uh, sort of working with all these groups, uh, you know, ha- uh, Houston and Dallas and Cincinnati and Frankfurt and Lexington on how together we can really, I mean, we're really, uh, really just a group of men and women that love bourbon. And, and together, I see that, that collectively that, that we can help everyone love it more. And that's really that's really for for us. It's about it's about pushing something, and really, it's not really a sell. It, it's it's a it's a love, and, uh, and and I'm I'm grateful to everyone involved, all all of the guests tonight. Uh, really enjoyed the conversation. Love everything you're doing, and keep it up. Cheers. All right, Pete. Thanks for having me on the Bourbon Pursuit. This has been a little bit of a fanboy dream come true. <laughs> oh gosh, you. hope we didn't disappoint. <laughs> <laughs> they they say never meet your idols. <laughs> <laughs> but you can find us at DallasBourbonClub.com, Bourbon Networking and Charity here in Big D. Nice. Ed Christopher, go ahead and round it out for us. He's drinking scotch. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I'm a little bit of a Lafroig fan, but uh, I want to back up. Oh, God, up. kick him off. Yeah. No. On the, on the bourbon it. podcast, oh, the dirty I knew boy. It. I knew it. I'll, I'll switch back oh, to old, old, old Monk. Uh, I just want to say something real quick before I, before I close. David, there's something about you. I just want to take a minute to acknowledge you. I want to call you Congressman David or Senator David. You've got like this – you've got like this uh, – perfect spokesmodel of a bourbon club look to you and uh i i I definitely want to do more with with everyone here this has been a a tremendous honor i've definitely appreciated it you can join houston bourbon society check it out on the facebook group Uh, if you guys are ever in town the houston whiskey social is a great festival of spirits we do it every well this will be april next year uh and just uh, thank you so much for having me on kenny and ryan Absolutely. Give also a plug for, for your, your whiskey show as well. Oh, you know, <laughs> I always forget. Uh, I do a, a similar show uh, around spirits called Whiskey Neat. You can find it on uh, iTunes, Google Play, Facebook. We put the video up. Uh, you can find it at mywhiskeyneat.com. People ask why my whiskey neat because I, I like my whiskey neat. So Likewise. There you, go. You, can, you can check it out there. It's on the, all podcast platforms, and it's, it's a similar thing next week. We have uh, this week. We have Amroot on. We had Ashok Chokalingam. Speaking of difficult names yeah, to pronounce earlier, well. bless you. 
Yeah, yeah, bless you. And uh, next week we've got on Joe Heron from Copper and Kings. I know there's a, definitely a few Copper and King King fans Absolutely. listening to this. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was here last week. We had a ph- phenomenal time. So definitely check it out. Whiskey Neat. I'll throw a little shout out to to uh, It's Bourbon Night. A couple members that, uh, that 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 live here in Lexington, and and uh, to a, a young uh, guy and gal that uh, do a great job doing some fun with whiskey. It's Bourbon Night on YouTube. Very cool. Good deal. Give all well, our competitors again. a shout out. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Rising tide. Right? I think, I think, no, yeah, I, I think you guys have, have kind of set an anchor in. I think you're okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. The official podcast of bourbon and all. <laughs> yeah, it's self-proclaimed. <laughs> <laughs> So I, again, I do want to say thank you guys very much for joining tonight. It was a very fun conversation. Uh, I'm sure that if we weren't under a time crunch or anything like that, we'd probably talk for another hour just on oh, uh, random. Uh, I had it ride. <laughs> I loved it because I didn't even have I didn't even have to ask questions. I just listened to you guys talk. It was awesome. So 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 push stop on the record button and let's continue. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, well, it flew by for sure. It, it just means that we have our cued ourselves up for round two here. Uh, next time we need to get together and, and talk about this. I think it's it was it was really cool because there's a lot of people out there that are getting into bourbon and they are they're curious and they want to know more about it and they want to figure out what you can do. So I, I would say you know also if if you live in these areas, go check these guys' clubs out. If you're in Colorado or if you're in Alabama or Florida, New Hampshire, New York, or wherever there is a bourbon society or a whiskey club, or there is something around. And it's just a, it's an opportunity for you to do exactly what these guys had mentioned. It's an opportunity to go and network with people and drink good bourbon, uh, drink other people's good bourbon. Also have the opportunity to go on other barrel picks and, yes. and just essentially be a part of, of a greater community. For sure. So, and yeah. And I think, I mean, whether it's traditional, non-traditional, I don't even know what that means yet, but uh, you can definitely tell there's passion and that's what's common between everybody that loves bourbon and these societies represent that why we enjoy bourbon. It's not just the whiskey, it's hanging out, seeing those common people, getting to know new people and having that common interest in bourbon. That's what I love about it. And I think these societies really kind of elevate that, you know, to an extent. So uh, I agree. Really and cool conversation. Cool. And for those listening who are not in Houston and want to join the Houston Bourbon Society, I'll warn you now, Wade Woodard is a part of the group, and I apologize. <laughs> he's, he's been on the show before. Everybody knows him. <laughs> I'm a huge Wade fan. I'm a huge Wade fan, but I apologize. That's fabulous. That is fabulous. He's our and, TTB, uh, you know, commandant. Yes, he is. He knows everything. Uh, <laughs> but then there is also somebody that commented uh, in the in the comments as well. He said, you know, we've got 600 members in our local Facebook group and two or three guys snatch up everything. And now I can't get three or four members to even show up for a bottle share anymore. So, <laughs> so there, I can see that. <laughs> so there, are, there, are, there are some other things that we'll, we'll save that one for the next conversation. When we start talking about some of the flip sides of these things. But again, fellas, I want to say thank you so much. Um, you know, if you guys also have social media handles, make sure you go and follow them on social media. Also make sure you follow Bourbon Pursuit on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you do like what you hear, uh, and you would be a part of this community, uh, our community, the Bourbon Pursuit community. You can the also, best one. The, yeah, it's no, I'm kidding. The, the the Bourbon Pursuit Society. Should we should we claim that one now while we're at it too? Uh, just community. <laughs> <laughs> we're 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 not high class. Not enough, not enough. But you can go and support the show on Patreon, p a t r e o n dot com slash Bourbon Pursuit, where we do a lot of things like these guys. Uh, also do barrel picks. We've got a little community. We all love bourbon. However, we haven't done anything for charity, so maybe we should step it up and do something yes, for charity. Indeed. Yes, yes, indeed. I'll, I'll, I'll head that up for us. Let's do it. Yeah. Let's do this. a couple barrel picks for charity. So we can, like we can go ahead and get together on that. And Ryan, go ahead and wrap up the show for us. Yeah, thanks, guys. Great conversation. Loved every bit of it. Uh, and then to our audience, uh, you know, just let us know if you want to hear about a topic or so suggestions, feedback, comments. We love hearing from you all. Uh, this is why we do it is for you. So let us know what you think and uh, we'll see you next time.